Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Federation of Telangana Chambers of Commerce and Industry, I, Sayangita, take this opportunity to welcome you all for today's webinar on climate change and mitigation planning by industry. I acknowledge the valued presence of all the distinguished speakers here, Dr. Kameshwara Rao, former professor of environmental sciences from Andhra University, Vishakapatnam, and Mr. Praveen Yadav, head environmental and social risk, RBL Bank Limited, Mr. N. Sai Balaji, sustainable consultant, greening building, consulting and engineering, and our chairman and moderator of this session, Mr. G. Bala Subramaniam Garu, our office bearers and all. I would like to inform you that FTCCA is on its one not fifth years of journey and since its inspection has been proactively working for the benefit of trade and industry members and society at large. Climate change is a significant man-made global environmental challenge and it will continue to influence our world for generations to come if timely actions are not taken. At the Federation House, we are very mindful and have taken conscious decision to support the environmental ecosystem and industries to thrive and today's meeting is one such event. It is very important for each one of us to contribute towards having a cleaner, greener and safer environment and protecting our planet for future generations. Before I request our Senior Vice President, Mr. Meera Jaydev, sir, to deliver a welcome address, we would like to show a small promotional video of FTCCI. Thank you. 1917, the year when a dedicated organization, the Deccan Chamber of Commerce, was formed to encourage trade and commerce activities. The historical journey of the organization has witnessed great transformation as per the changing needs of the industry and businesses. The Federation of Telangana Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FTCCI, a legacy of excellence, voice of the industry, representing interests of over 25,000 businesses of all sizes, sectors and regions, is empowering industry and trade of Telangana State. A world leader in pharma, a global hub for vaccine, home to all major MNCs, leader in IT exports, an emerging first stop of India. FTCCI advocates a pro-business environment caters to the needs of MSMEs, budding entrepreneurs and traders through its advisory services in taxation, market information, industry-related issues, B2B connection. The Chamber has its nominees in the state-level advisory committees to help drive business productivity. FTCCI aids in providing certificate of origin for exporters, issues visa recommendation for business travels. The Federation imparts job skills through its dedicated skill center. It has adopted 14 government ITIs to improve the employability of students. With a uniquely global perspective, the FTCCI events reach a highly engaged audience, policymakers, and stakeholders aiming towards Atma Nirbhar Bharat. FTCCI to work with government, tell us and guide us that we can do what we can to remain competitive, to remain better than our competition. FTCCI for joining us and I thank the office bearers of FTCCI for inviting me. Jai Telangana, Jai Hind. Come and be a part of this dynamic and proactive organization. Together, let's realize the vision for a progressive future. Now I invite Mr. Mila Jaydev, Senior Vice President of FTCCI, to please tell your welcome address. Sir, please unmute yourself, sir. 
డాక్టర్ కామేశ్వర గారు కోటం రాజు ఫార్మర్ ప్రొఫెషనల్ ఎన్విరాల్మెంట్ సైన్సెస్ ఆంధ్ర యూనివర్సిటీ విశాఖపట్నం మిస్టర్ ప్రవీణ్ జాదవ్ హెడ్ ఎన్విరాల్మెంట్ అండ్ సోషల్ రిస్క్ ఆర్బిఎల్ లిమిటెడ్ బ్యాంక్ లిమిటెడ్ ఎన్ సాయి బాలాజీ గారు సస్టైనబిలిటీ కన్సల్టెంట్ గ్రీన్ బిల్డింగ్ కన్సల్టింగ్ అండ్ ఇంజనీరింగ్ థాయిలాండ్ మిస్టర్ పి భాస్కర్ బక్కారెడ్డి గారు ఎగ్జిక్యూటివ్ డైరెక్టర్ జీడిమట్ లైఫ్ లైన్ ట్రీట్మెంట్స్ లిమిటెడ్ మిస్టర్ జి బాలసుబ్రహ్మణ్యం చైర్ ఎన్విరాల్మెంట్ కమిటీ ఎఫ్టీసీసీఐ మేనేజింగ్ కమిటీ మెంబర్స్ అండ్ పాస్ట్ ప్రెసిడెంట్స్ అండ్ స్పెషల్ థ్యాంక్స్ టు క్యాథి ఆర్గనైజింగ్ ఆల్ దీస్ థింగ్స్ థ్యాంక్ యూ వెరీ మచ్ అండ్ పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ లేడీస్ అండ్ జెంటిల్మెన్ వెరీ గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ టు ఆల్ ఆఫ్ యూ ఆన్ బిహా ఆఫ్ ది ఫెడరేషన్ ఆఫ్ తెలంగాణ ఛాంబర్ ఆఫ్ కామర్స్ అండ్ ఇండస్ట్రీ ఇట్ గివ్స్ టే మీ ఇమేజ్ ప్లేసర్ టు వెల్కమ్ యూ ఆల్ టుడేస్ వెబినార్ on climate change and mitigation planning of by industry climate change is an appeal battle and threat to the future of our planet but there is still time for us to adapt it mitigated its effects with our combined efforts of suitable migration mitigation actions climate change can impact all the major sectors in the economy and it is the estimated that climate change results significant economic losses despite lower per capita energy consumption and carbon emissions emissions compared to global averages india is the third largest greenhouse gas emitter and accounts for the 7.5 for about the 7.1% of the total global emissions global warming is affecting at various waves like increasing the temperature melting of glaciers more number of occurrences of floods cyclones etc which is the serve damage to human life and properties the recent cyclone across the state of us example of changes in the climate this cannot be ignored any more either by the government or by the people of the works of life and our responsibility to ensure to better living the conditions for our future generations the awareness programs such as a today's webinar on climate change and mitigation planning by industry is timely and measures that will be suggested by the experts should be adopted and implemented by the industry for safer and environment and mitigation of climate change transferring the way that individuals governments and industry produce and usage of changing activities and reduce eliminate emissions and developing clean and efficient infrastructure is important i once again thank you all experts for their time and presence today thank you very much thank you very much ankita for organizing of this meeting conducting thank you sir now i invite mr ji balasubramanian chair of environment committee please give introductory remarks and introduce the speakers Yeah, I would like to thank uh, one and all for uh, giving this opportunity. First of all, I would like to thank uh, our uh, Senior Vice President, Mr. Mela uh, Jayadevji, and Vice President, Mr. Suresh Kumar Singh from the Federation, to join here. Uh, Federation, one of the objectives is to support the industry and important stakeholders. in handling the different issues for uh, continual improvement or the improved compliance the climate change is been uh, accepted as one of the important aspects there may be some debate on the numbers etc that means what will be the temperature rise or what will be the impact what is the uh, losses which area will be affected more which sector will be affected more the numbers and pressures maybe that is the different scientists may have some kind of views but it is globally accepted now the climate change is one of the important aspects and uh, considering this 
through the federation, uh, we sort of uh, uh, doing some webinars which will be useful to the industry sectors. And especially industry as a participant, target, targeted participant, this webinar has been planned. So the industry is very much interested to know what uh, they can do. Maybe very little steps also. I strongly believe the digital risk is one of the important approach. I strongly believe sometimes uh, magical intervention will be required. So with this background, we thought of creating the, uh, this webinar. For example, I strongly believe, first of all, uh, to do anything, first of all, we need to measure the monitor so that that will give an idea of where we are. So without this numbers, it's very really difficult uh, for anybody to understand where we are. And similarly, what are the few topics in which we can have play uh, some sort of importance to the industry uh, so that they will uh, sensitize and they can take it forward. With this background, we have selected three important uh, uh, topics for this webinar. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kameshwara, who is a very senior academician, more than four decades of experience. And the good friend, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to join here. And uh, uh, he contributed more than 65 research papers, 14 chapters uh, in different books, and uh, he guided more than 15 RD and consultancy projects. Uh, he has uh, worked in the different uh, uh, committees uh, and uh, expert in the academic boards of more than 10 universities. Uh, he was a member in the several uh, important government committees such as the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change, Government of India, that is called uh, uh, the Expert Appraisal Committee, the and the EPI. Similarly, State Level uh, Expert Appraisal Committee and also State Pollution Control Board, especially the uh, Government of Andhra Pradesh. Presently, he is serving as a visiting professor for two universities and also managing trustee of Centre for People's Forestry and Health. Uh, I'm thankful, sir, for accepting the, the, to make a brief presentation on green belt and carbon sequestration because all the industries now mandated to have a green belt. So, probably uh, just through the development of green belt, there are other benefits too, you know, apart from the legal compliance. Plus, it is in a way helping the climate change, whatever we are in the limited scale. Uh, second, I would like to invite Mr. Praveen, the other a good friend to me. Presently, he is working as the head uh, ENS uh, risk division of RBI India Limited. Praveen Jada is a postgraduate in chemical engineering with 20 years of research and industry experience. His research area was in the field of energy and environment, and he has published eight research papers in the international journals and conferences. He has contributed to the India's National Communication to the ENFCC, research on alternative refusals under the Monitor Protocol and the technology development for the CO2 capture from the power plants, etc. His industry experience included R&D plant trials for process improvement, production uh, and the cost reduction, etc. Uh, thank you, Mr. Praveen Jadav, for accepting to take a uh, uh, talk on greenhouse gas, uh, gases, quantification and reporting and overview. I would like to say this will be the first step for any industry to understand what is their uh, impact uh, carbon footprint uh, uh, with reference to climate. And thank you for accepting my invitation. I introduce the third speaker, Mr. Sai Balazi, uh, sustainable production. Uh, he's a metal engineer with a sustainability professional experience, uh, especially with uh, five years of exclusive experience in sustainability and the corporations employ environmental friendly practices. His earlier assignments include ESG analysis and reporting in accordance with the GRI principles, helping the clients to understand the net zero carbon design and science based technology reporting and CDP disclosures, etc. Also, he's having the rich experience in the energy auditing as per the lead guidelines. He holds different certificates, including a green classroom professional and the gem classroom professional. Thank you, Mr. Shalbalaji, for accepting the, uh, to join this webinar and uh, share your thoughts. Uh, he will be taking, he has been requested to share his thoughts on carbon disclosure project and overview. Uh, for many of people, maybe it's a new subject. Now, uh, in, because of the supply chain uh, pressure or the climate change commitments, etc., the many industries are going for this. Uh, you are aware that the government of India has also announced uh, our roadmap, including the uh, addition of the greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 by 40 percent and the increase of the solar energy capacity and also achieving net zero etc etc 
Again, I would like to say uh, I strongly believe uh, the concept is good for the print paper. So this view, uh, these are some of the topics uh, which will uh, create some sort of thought process for the industry stakeholder. With this brief introduction, I would like to uh, now uh, start the technical presentation. So, yes. Now I request the first speaker, uh, Pramil uh, Jadav, to share his uh, presentation on the greenhouse gas quantification and reporting and overview. Uh, for all the participants, uh, if you have any questions, you can put in the chat box, which will be addressed in the q and section, uh, preferably at, after the completion of the three speakers. Also, if you have any remedy in any challenge in posing the chat box, you can raise your hand. So we will help, uh, our team will help you to reach it. And I request Mr. Pramiji, uh, you can take for 20 minutes uh, for your presentation. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you, FTCCI organizers and all the dignitaries. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the participants to take your time on a Saturday. I hope the presentation is shared and I'm audible. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the topic shared uh, to me is GHG quantification. GHG is greenhouse gas, the seven greenhouse gases recognized internationally as the uh, source behind all the global warming and resulting into climate change that we are looking into. So as uh, the earlier speakers explained the need for the quantification, without monitoring and uh, quantification, we cannot control the emissions. Hence, it is important and various regulatory requirements as well as some voluntary initiatives have requested all the industries to report their GHGs and have certain targets so that we all can contribute to the limitation, limiting the global warming. Uh, I'll briefly cover the background, why it is being done and the business case for monitoring and reporting of greenhouse gases. We'll cover the two recognized standards which are used globally uh, to monitor and take few case studies on how to calculate the greenhouse gases. Uh, in the reporting, I'll briefly discuss because uh, later there's a session on the CDP. And finally, uh, the new topic on the carbon neutrality or net zeros, we'll try to see what is the difference between them and what does it mean to have uh, the, uh, dif these two different targets. So last few years, we have seen many global leaders uh, coming and making a call to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions globally. Uh, this includes the United Nations, uh, IPCC, as well as uh, back to home, our Reserve Bank of India. So RBI has also recently taken uh, climate risk assessment integration into the credit risk for the banks. So every bank you go to uh, take some loans, etc. as a corporate, you may be required to report your greenhouse gases and take up some targets so that you get better tenors of the interest on and better interest rate possibly going further. This is only a discussion it recently started. We'll see about that as well. So coming straight to the point, uh, what is carbon footprint? The topic as you uh, had seen in the first slide is greenhouse gas. Uh, however, 60% of the warming approximately is attributed to carbon dioxide. Hence, the, all the greenhouse gases are reported in terms of carbon as well or carbon dioxide. So carbon footprint, GHG footprint, GHG accounting, all of these words try to say same thing. So carbon footprint is usually expressed as tons of carbon dioxide in a year. So any organization or any event or one particular project can report its global warming impact in terms of tons of carbon dioxide emitted or its carbon footprint. When we calculate all the other seven, total seven greenhouse gases and convert them into GHG uh, or carbon equivalent, this is called as carbon footprint. And it accounts for all the other six greenhouse gases excluding carbon dioxide. So it can be calculated for an organization, for an event, for a product, for a person. When the organization calculates, it is typically for a financial year because it is considered as accounting. So similar kind of quality check, audit, 
and rigorous calculations are expected to go behind the carbon footprint calculations. So uh, by both the quantification methodologies, there are three types of emissions. One, which is scope one or the direct emissions. Uh, these happen within the premises of an organization. So these typically include the fuel burnt on site, the vehicles owned by companies and fugitive emissions in the process. Uh, type two or indirect emissions happen because some services are being used, either electricity that we use from the grid or from some supplier. And in some uh, colder regions, there is also district heating in which they buy steam or heating from the uh, external parties. And this contributes to the scope two or indirect emissions. In the last part, scope three, other indirect emissions, whatever is attributable to the industry includes such as transportation, upstream transportation, downstream transportation, during use of the product, investment made by the organization, all such emissions are called as other indirect or scope three emissions. We will have a detailed slide on explanation and what is considered under each of these scopes. So I'm just giving it us introduction at this stage now. So why we are required to do the carbon footprint? Uh, there are regulatory requirements as uh, sir explained, uh, the business responsibility and sustainability reporting mandatory for the top two 1000 companies by market cap on the uh, stock exchange in India uh, are required to complete this report and which is asking scope one and two emissions mandatorily. Scope three is still optional, but as a leading organization, you are expected to have it and going further, it may become mandatory as well. Uh, the various regulatory requirements like energy efficiency or perform achievement trade, uh, trade PAT mechanism, this is also one indirect form of carbon accounting in which the energy calculations were done based on a particular base here. The India is considering national carbon markets to show how we can reduce the emissions in the country and at a best uh, price. So uh, carbon markets are expected to give us the opportunities which are lowest cost. The Many investors are also asking. Similarly, BRSR is an investor driven uh, requirement. So, foreign investors had requested SEBI to take up this. Similarly, some of the investors, uh, especially as I explained about the uh, RBI's recent initiative and climate risk integration, going further, even the banks may request individual in industries to report their GHG intensities and what is the plan to reduce it further. Many customers. We have seen last 15, 20 years, especially the large brands, global brands have been requesting that you reduce your emissions. There are many NGOs which uh, identify the largest emission indust emitting industries and uh, make public claims or calls for the emission reduction targets to be taken. We have seen uh, some of the customers requiring emissions uh, through the life cycle assessment or through CDP or on other mechanisms to be reported so that they are aware of what is the impact of their supply chain on the carbon footprint. Uh, coming to the recognized standards for the carbon footprint, uh, they are recognized standards globally. The first one is Greenhouse Gas Protocol developed by World Business Council on Sustainable Development and World Resource Institute, WBCSD and WRI. Uh, this was the first emission standard uh, developed. Later, ISO 14064 was also based on the GG protocol. And this is a externally, uh, this is possible to get it externally assured like any other ISO standard. Uh, the greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, N2O, these are also occurring naturally. And there are four industrial greenhouse gases, HFC, hydrofluorocarbons, byproducts of the refrigeration industry, perfluorocarbons, PFCs, which are byproducts of the aluminum smelters, and SF6, which we know is used as an uh, inert gas in the semiconductor industry, etc. And there is a seventh gas added a few years ago, which is NF3. So the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, has many standards, including a corporate GG accounting and reporting standard, 
it gives various guidelines what is considered in the scope two what is considered in the scope three how to calculate the emissions what is meant by boundary uh, this standard is very widely used globally and most companies which report their emissions either in annual reports to cdp to investors base their calculations based on the gg protocol the gg protocol has also given certain standards and guidances on their website uh, the link is shared in the uh, slide which will be circulated to you later uh, the summary of the greenhouse gases as we explained scope 1 2 and 3 direct indirect and other indirect the seven gases are reported on the top so as you can see the or scope 1 which is direct emissions happen within the company's facilities as well as company owned vehicles scope 3 whenever the purchased electricity steam and heating or cooling is used uh, the emissions happening outside the company boundary but because the company is using these services the emissions are attributed to the company so these are called scope 3 uh, scope 2 and in scope 3 there are two types called upstream and downstream in uh, next slide we'll see the uh, distribution as well so in this scope 3 there are 15 types of categories in the upstream we have to account for the purchased goods and services uh, capital goods fuel and energy related emissions which are not accounted in the scope 2 such as losses in the electricity or upstream transportation distribution waste generated in the operations which is given out for the processing or treatment end of life business travel employee committing which is uh, to the daily uh, operations of the office business travel is over and above the regular office wherever they go to the different uh, plants or business travel etc uh, business development etc that is considered under the business travel upstream leased assets so if we have certain outsource uh, supply uh, supply chain uh, issues then that can be considered in the upstream leased assets once the company works on the uh, or develops the product uh, the further emissions are called downstream which are towards the downstream transportation and distribution uh, our company's goods go to the different uh, customers or the traders etc so distributors that that is considered in the downstream uh, transportation distribution processing of sold goods some of the products may not be uh, fully usable hence some of the further downstream processors may be using it uh, some or other form of energy to further make it usable so this is considered in the processing of sold products use of sold products so during use of uh, during the lifetime of your product whatever energy is being consumed our emissions are happening those are also attributed to the sold products uh, end of life treatment if regulations require that the particular goods needs to be uh, properly treated before it can be disposed this is considered in the end of life uh, treatment of the sold products as well downstream assets uh, investments and franchise are typically for the investment kind of companies like banks and asset management companies so scope 1 and 2 are mandatory in most reporting requirements scope 3 most indian companies had started only reporting about the upstream and downstream transportation because they have the bills and uh, sources of origin and wherever uh, they send the products outside they are also billed so the bills and uh, Uh, business travel because the air tickets etc are available directly to the company so some com- uh, ma- most companies have so far reported only uh, the limited scope 3 emissions however the regulations are becoming stringent going further so as per the uh, global investors if the scope 3 all these 15 categories are contributing more than 40% to the total greenhouse gas emissions including scope 1 2 3 this is also mandatory to report and take a target of scope 3 as well uh, coming to the iso code in 064 so this is a standard developed by iso and it has three parts the first part is about organization level so we will use iso code in 064 part 1 if we are calculating emissions at a organization level if we are con- calculating emissions or emission reduction at a project level within one part of the uh, industry let us say scope 1 is one sugar uh, factory then scope 2 can be only your biomass based boiler so only this project is your boundary and 
emission reductions from that or the emissions from that can be calculated using the part two of the standard. The part three is about the verification and validation, which is audit. Hence, uh, it is only useful for the auditors or if we are getting it audited. So the uh, steps in the implementation of ISO 14064 include, first we have to set a boundary and define the scope. So if my complete sugar factory is my boundary or I'm considering certain part of it, which all scope three emissions I'm going to calculate and what are the different sources of emissions that are included in the boundary. We, once the boundary is identified, what are the different GOG sources, sinks and reservoirs? So sources can include as we discussed us earlier, all the emission sources in the boundary, which is your fuel consumption like boilers, hot air generators, DG sets, and company owned vehicles, which are operating on the uh, industry's premises, like some uh, on site uh, transmission cranes, etc., or some uh, supervisory uh, or uh, vehicles used for the surveys or. Uh, within the uh, plant transportation, like going to some distant uh, wastewater treatment plant, etc. Then selection of appropriate quantification methodology. So I, both ISO 14064 as well as the GG protocol give different quantification methodologies. We'll see one such example in the next slide. Then collection of activity data. Uh, as we discussed earlier, let us say if we want to calculate the emissions from a boiler, then activity data includes all the fuel consumptions in the particular reporting period, which is typically a first April of the uh, this year to the 31st March of uh, next year. So financial year complete. And either the audited bills purchased from the purchase department or the actual consumption for the boiler house log sheets or certain sophisticated methods like SAP based log logs, etc., are used for the activity data collection. And uh, mind as this is ISO, this will be third party verifiable. Hence the auditor will see some of the sample bills of whatever activity data we are claiming that this is used for the source. Then we calculate uh, the GAG emissions from the calculated activity data. And in the final step, we develop a report. So this is called the greenhouse gas inventory report or greenhouse gas accounting. So uh, the Interesting part about some examples now. Uh, we have selected only a couple of examples because of the limitation of the time. So this is the basic of calculation method. In the scope one, we take the activity data as in one case we discussed, this can be consumption of your uh, fuel like coal, natural gas, diesel used in the energy uh, generation and the GAG emission factor. Now, these GAG emission factor are given by various standard international uh, methodologies like IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, some independent uh, agencies also give certain develop uh, emission factors for certain methodologies like WRI has developed transportation related emission factor for India. Some regulators like DEFRA in UK also publishes emission factors which are used within the reporting of reporting within UK or United Kingdom. For the figurative emissions, which is also part of scope one, it is directly activity data, like release of refrigerants or recharge of refrigerant into its emission factor. So each refrigerant has an emission factor. We have included some of the samples in the next slide. For the scope two, which is indirect emissions, we have taken an example of one purchased electricity within the operations. So here activity data includes electricity consumption in a monitoring period. So for monthly electricity bills are used for 12 months into emission factor of grid, or if it is an independent supplier, the emission factor for that particular IPP or uh, captive power plant of the supplier. So here, uh, there are many important factors to be considered for the source of data there has to be a proper quality check like if it is a, a actual boiler log then the whether the way bridges are calibrated how we monitor the actual consumption how the stock balance happens if it is electricity or uh, even quantification of the uh, way, way, way bridges etc whether the meters are calibrated 
for the conversion of quantities of fuels uh, the calorific values are used because the emission factors most emission factors are available in energy terms as we know let us say take example of coal uh, coal can be uh, coal can have calorific value of 3000 for the domestic coal as well as up to 5500 for the imported coal hence it is not possible to always give emission factors in terms of weight per ton of coal this is the emission factor hence the emissions are always reported in energy terms so the weights are converted into energy that is delivered using its calorific value so the proper sources of calorific value are also required for the calculation of scope to emissions, the Central Electricity Authority under the Ministry of Power comes up with an annual uh, emission factor. The recent available factor is of uh, 2021. Uh, the web link takes you to the, uh, this particular report where they have said the average grid emission factor for India is 0 0.79 tons of CO2 per MWH. MWH is 1000 kWh of 1000 units. So once you have the meg megawatt tower, we have to simply multiply by 0 0.79 to get the tons of emissions. So as I was saying, uh, the all the seven greenhouse gases can be converted in carbon terms or CO2 terms. So these are the global warming potential or the ability, individual gases warming ability compared to carbon dioxide is uh, developed. So on this scale, carbon dioxide value is always one because all the gases are compared with carbon dioxide. So these are the different global warming potentials of uh, the other gases. Uh, for example, how do we use the GWPs now? If we recharge one ton of SF6, we have to simply multiply 23,500 to, to get the total tons of CO2 emissions from one ton of SF6. Uh, sir had requested to specifically consider uh, the HFCs or refrigerants that are used. So uh, one point to note, the, note is uh, under the Kigali agreement, government of India has also agreed to phase down the HFCs. Uh, these are the global warming potentials of different greenhouse gases. Uh, CFCs which were also already banned because their ozone depletion potential also had very high global warming potential. So uh, later the H HFC blends were developed, which have little lower greenhouse gases and the new age natural refrigerants like ammonia, water and carbon dioxide, which has used in the industrial chillers, et cetera. They have lowest global warming potential, hence their use is recommended. Followed, uh, followed by them, there are hydrocarbon blends like butane, pentane, which also have a significantly lower global warming potential. So, by switching your refrigerants to lower lower GWP value refrigerants, we can reduce our total carbon dioxide emission, our, our, our uh, particular carbon uh, footprint. Uh, coming to another calculation sample of uh, scope one, let us say any fuel, we have taken example of diesel, which is commonly used either in the company owned vehicles or the DG sets. So one liter of diesel, we have to now convert the one liter of diesel to energy terms. So the density is used to multiply and get the weight of diesel. The fuel specifications like uh, there is BS4, BS5, BS6 fuels, which the suppliers like BPCL also report the densities and calorific values on their website. One such example is given here. The values are a little outdated. Uh, so these, these were possibly BS4 or 5 specifications. So we can always get the latest numbers. So by multiplying the quantity and calorific value, we get energy input. 8450 kilocalorie for one liter of diesel. Uh, because the emission factor is based on terajoule, we convert kilocalorie to joule now and terajoule to get once terajoule is available, we multiply that with the emission factor of diesel, which is 71.4 given by the IPCC uh, to get the total tons of CO2 emissions. Here it is only liters, so the value is in available in kg. Once we have 1000 liters, it becomes straight away 2.57 tons of CO2.
uh, one interesting examples uh, the emission like emissions we can also use the same formulas to get the avoidance how much co2 is avoided so we have taken example of one led uh, bulb earlier if uh, to get the same lumens at 100 watt bulb we have chosen led of 12 watt then assuming daily operation hours of 10 per uh, 10 hours per day the average energy saving is 100 minus 12 which is 88 watt to convert the annual energy saving multiply this uh, with uh, 10 hours 88 watt 365 days a year and because this is watt hour we have to convert this to mwh divided by 10 to the power 6 to get the annual consumption and we early, earlier we saw the grid emission factor of india 0.79 multiply that to get the tons of co2 which is avoided by changing one light bulb from incandescent bulb to 12 watt led so the same calculations which are used to calculate the emissions can be used to also calculate the savings or co2 avoided so recently we have seen many examples or announcements from corporates about carbon neutrality here one of the standards like publicly available specification pes 2060 is used internationally here we have to calculate greenhouse gases so first step is measure using either the wri protocol uh, gag protocol that we just discussed or iso 14064 part one which is for the organization level reduce using various energy efficiency measures so uh, reduce your energy consumption by taking energy efficiency measures switch to the renewable energy as much as possible reduce it within your organization then uh, go for external uh, measures like electricity uh, to renewables etc through open markets or having some supplier of renewable energy then here the offsets like carbon credits recognized by any international standards are allowed to negate your remaining emissions so in 2019 we have developed uh, one and uh, certified one industry like kirloskar oil engines in kagal maharashtra uh, the report of that is available in the web link that we have shared so we can go through the report how to calculate uh, reduce the emissions internally and then purchase the offsets which are uh, in the coils case we have purchased carbon credits from the un developed cdm mechanism and declared a carbon neutrality for one year so carbon neutrality is Typically, when the company says I'm carbon neutral, that means the previous year's carbon footprint is calculated and the after reducing emissions internally, the remaining emissions are offset using purchase of carbon credits, either the CDM mechanism credits or the VERs like from the uh, voluntary markets. When the companies are talking about net zero now, this is not for one year. Remember here, offsets are not allowed to be used only with the minuscule part, which is impossible to be offset, uh, re reduced internally in 2040 or 50, that only in that case, the reduction using offsets is allowed. So here a company has to reduce its emissions, the absolute emissions to near zero. Here, any ton which is emitted, and you, if we use the offset, we still have one ton left in the atmosphere because we have emitted the previous year. So we, when we are talking about net zero, it is actually net zero because the reduction projects which suck the air uh, CO2 out of atmosphere like plantation, nature-based nature offsets or actual carbon dioxide capture from the air, these kind of offsets are allowed under the net zero. So once company says net zero, it remains net zero going further. Hence, this is a longer term announcements. Most companies have taken targets of 2050 as the net zero year. Some companies which are service oriented where the technology limitations, limitations may not be there. They have taken earlier like 2040 or 35 as the net zero announcement year. In uh, the previous slide, we saw that we have to reduce emissions as per the science based target. So what should be my trajectory of emission reduction per year is calculated using this methodology which is science-based targets, which is a non-profit uh, from the cooperation of CDP Carbon Disclosure Project, WBCSD, UNGC, and WWF. Here, each company, this is the global carbon budget. 
So in 2010, the global emissions were at 49 gigatons of CO2. To reduce or keep the temperature rise within two degrees, we have to take the uh, total atmospheric CO2 emissions to between 14 to 29 gigatons of CO2. Here, using this methodology, each company can develop its own target, which is scientifically approved, or they can claim that the targets are in line with the International Paris Climate Change Agreement. So these are some of the solutions to reduce your individual carbon footprint, which includes reduce your uh, own vehicles by taking public transport or go for electric vehicles, which is charged by uh, renewable energy, buy local, reduce your consumptions of uh, meat. Yeah. So uh, that is it from me. Uh, I will be open to any questions that are there if uh, we have to take it now or at the end. Sorry. Uh, for making a very useful presentation on GAG contribution reporting, especially the GAG protocols, ISO standards, and the brief definition of the ISO 2, 1, 2, 3, and how to calculate uh, the reference documents, etc. I suggest that the question and answers will be taken after the completion of all the speakers so that we can save the time. Sure, sure, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Now, I would like to invite the second speaker. Dr. K. Thomas Rider to make a presentation on the green belt and the proper sequestration. Sir, you can unmute, sir. Thomas Rider. So, good morning. Good morning. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Please proceed. First of all, let me uh, thank Telangana FTCCI for giving me this opportunity. And I also, I congratulate the organization. I think it's the first CCI in India to take up this kind of activity, especially on the uh, climate change, as well as the, this green belt concepts. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and express my pronouns to all attending this seminar, the dignitaries and my co-speakers, Sri Praveen Jadav and Sai Balaji Garu and chair of the environment program, Bajwabhinyu Garu and vice president and president of FCCIT. Well, today I would like to share some of my views on this uh, a green belts and carbon sequestrations and what can we do uh, in the light of this climate change and mitigation activities. Uh, permit me to share my screen. <laughs> well, I think uh, green belts uh, in India, we talk about the uh, green belts. Uh, for nearly 50 years, but very sad to note that there is no exclusive green belt policy in India, except for different guidelines in the Ministry of Environment or in AMPs or in the National Forest Policy or Forest Conservation Act or in some uh, local bodies, uh, rules, and so on. But there is no exclusive green belt regulation or a policy in India or for any state, in fact. And that's the reason why most where green belts are recommended for 
mitigation of pollution or something like that, their objectives are not getting realized. Well, in fact, we have made a survey of this also and found that most of the industries who are maintaining these green belts are also not happy with it. And at the same time, people around it are also not much happy about it. And there is no mechanism of reporting what a green belt does and what is doing and so on. So this is where we, we have only one rule saying a one third of the land or a 33% or 25% or something like that to have irrespective of whether it is a small scale project or a big scale project or a uh, whether it is in Himalayas or whether it is in uh, a metro cities like Hyderabad or whatever, whatever it is, we have the same recommendation for all types of areas and all types of projects and so on. And the species that these green belts in most cases, what they choose is what the species are available in the market or what they can grow easily, but not a designed plantation or whatsoever it is. That is the present state. And because of this, in fact, the CPCB guidelines are uh, why we wanted green belts and recommended are it is to have or preserve the natural environment as far as possible so that the land use change may not affect largely on the different species inhabiting that area. And also the ecosystem doesn't lose to render its services like charging of the uh, groundwaters or regulation of the microclimate or providing habitat and so on. And in industries especially, we think that and we'll have for air pollution, control or dust filtration or noise control and so on and so forth. And it also provide habitat for, and like that, you have many advantages, plus, 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 if you go on listing like this. And all these are the positive things that we need to, but I don't find even in the Vishakhapatnam steel plant, which has a nearly 5,000 acres of green belt, in their reports, they speak about anything, what their green belt does or whatsoever it is, and all these things. Only some sweeping remarks, which we find in some small textbooks and so on. So the general perception of the, on the green belts to a common man or a common industry or a small industry people and all these, well, this is the outcome of these are the uh, six uh, frequently emerging answers from the different uh, people. Productivity of the land is marginal compared to the cost of it. Say if it is a land in the Vishakhapatnam or some Hyderabad or something, it could be a square yard, a lakh or a two lakhs and something like that. And the productivity that is coming from the green belt is so on and not able to control pollution or whether the green belt is there or not, the pollution levels are constant. Growing them only for compliance purposes or complying with the rules of the uh, land. And there is no return on the investments made. That's And it's an additional burden to some industries. Or some people look at it as a, a land resource for them in the future, in the event, if something happens and so on. But well, beyond this, we have a, a large multi-purpose and multi-programs uh, uh, that are results that we can expect from these green belts. And that's the reason why uh, most people, because of this perception, they have ignored it as a non-productive area in the, any company. I, I see in many companies, in the, their EH sec, section or something like, they don't have an exclusive ecologist or something to maintain their green belt. They simply think that a horticulturist can do it. 
But if an ecologist also is that, the green belt's productivity would be in a different way. The expectations could be something. And sometimes an in charge of the green belt may be reporting to a very junior management level cadre of people and so on and so forth. And, very, and hardly any industry have ever used or tried to account for these uh, the services or benefits accrued from these green belts in their financial or economic or ecological or environmental audits. Very rarely, very rarely they are reported about the green belt benefits accrued from the in their audit reports and so on. So this is all. Why? Because even the industrialists or the investors or uh, people uh, are not giving that much importance there, but now it's the time we had an opportunity again to revisit these thinking and this set of mind. And now we had new opportunities. In fact, it's not a new opportunity, but still we can consider it as a new opportunity because again, this trading is coming over it. So carbon sequestration and carbon stocking is as old as almost uh, from Kyoto Protocol to now. Uh, it's more than a one and a half decade or two decades even. 97, I think 97 to 2002 <laughs> and so on. But now again, it is materializing because they were simplified. And earlier it was a mechanism that requires a lot of monitoring, verification, certification, and then most of the costs or most of the benefits accrued in terms of money will go on to these consultants and so on to pay them and on these verification monitoring and so on. But now it is made somewhat simpler and I and many climatologists uh, hope for that it will be more simplified and India also is just taking, taking a very soft stand. And now many people can enter into it, whether they hold a big green belt or a very small green belt or a whatsoever it is. Well, but in fact, carbon stocking and carbon sequestration is only an incidental or a co-benefit of a green belt. Uh, it's only a co-benefit. But we can maximize these green belts, ecological and economic benefits, so as it can address another major challenge of climate vulnerability to the farmers and uh, farm laborers and shepherds who are losing. Uh, many ecosystems are vulnerable now, especially the cropping ecosystems and so on. I can show you. <laughs> Well, these are the scenarios, different RCP scenarios, and it is expected that nearly up to 4.78 degrees centigrade uh, on average in different parts of India, it may go on. And with this rise in temperature up to that period the, in the coming 50 or 55 or 60 years, well, <clears throat> Uh, the major impact could be on the agroforestry systems, especially the crop systems. I'm sorry. Well, these are the Increased humidity in the air while soil moisture will diminish. That's a, one of the bad symptoms for any ecosystems because soil moisture and soil moisture availability is most important thing for the rest of the biological activities. And water availability in the surface water, water bodies will be depleting fast and resulting in decline in the period of availability of their were available for eight months or nine months in the past, they will be available only for three months or four months because of increased evaporation, evapotranspiration, and 
all these. And the major impact would be on the agroforestry systems can only cope up. The crop systems can will be affected. Even rice, wheat, or even dryland crops can be affected if not proper care. But agroforestry systems can cope up some of these challenges compared to the annual cropping systems. That's where if the ag these green belts can be uh, seen for a purpose of agroforestry approach also in the, providing them, then the benefits would be very high and it will be beneficial to many people. Well, it can address the decline in food production, large number of farmers, farm laborers, and I already spoke about that, especially the declined fodder because most fodders are annual things and it impacts again on dairy and meat supplies, making them expensive and so on. So why green belts? Why only these agroforestry systems that we can, can we should consider is even in the climate change mitigation, IPCC says that land use changes represents major emissions. They account for more than 25% of the global emissions. And in countries like India, where, where land is scarce and population is very high, it is very important how wisely we use and how effectively we use and so on. It's not only the per capita lands is decimating year by year, also the land is degrading. Throughout the world, it affects almost half of the population, world population of 7 billion and uh, many ecosystems are getting threatened. And even an FAO report says that by 2050, we need another 500 million hectares area of new agriculture land to address the food security problem. That's where, why in India, even if it is a small area of land, which we are using it for biological productivity, whether it is an agriculture, or a crop or an agroforestry system or a green belt. We need to convert it into a biological productivity that helps all these things. And uh, this IPBES platform, again, the biodiversity and ecosystem services platform, are again, a body of the uh, IUCN and also IPCCC, 70% uh, of all natural and ice-free land in the world is affected by human use. Well, that can be afforded by very big nature, nations and so on, but not in India. And so in India, even if it is a smaller area of a half acre holding or a quarter acre of holding or a half hectare holding, it is very important to us. And you can see in the past 50 years, there was a lot of change in the land use. Even the agricultural land was diminishing here slightly. And also the land that we consider as permanent pastures and grazing land. So both these are, will be getting affected with the climate change and that is where at least if it is 1% of it or a half percent of the total land use, green belts can accommodate that half percent and contribute to the climate vulnerable people. Unfortunately, the climate change causes are different from climate change sufferers, whether it is at the country level or at the individual levels and something like that and so on. Uh, so what we can do here is Right, this importance of sea sequestration in the agroforestry or green belt systems. Well, if it is agroforestry, we have 25.3 million hectares of land and about, and these can be carbon sequestration potential of these systems could range between 0.25 to 
nearly 19 million grams carbon per hectare per year and for tree crops and you can see for the annual crops or crop components like rice, wheat, maize and something like it could be 0.01 to 0.6. So here you can see the clear difference between these two, the tree crop systems or agroforestry systems can harvest or sequester more carbon into this. And contribution of agroforestry in soil carbon sequestration, soil is one of the major uh, source for sequestering carbon. Even this green belt soils also can be uh, conditioned in such a way that can they sequester more carbon also. And this could range up to nearly four tons per carbon per hectare per year as per the present data sets available with the uh, agriculture and food security uh, departments and so on. And this, these are very low compared to some other tropical countries which are doing very good. Like Japan is carrying out some of these uh, sequestration projects in nine countries. There in the tropical, in nine tropical countries where the soil carbon or the per hectare production is almost three to four times greater than what we are having. And this is the gap between a good management and a poor management. And next, well, I think I'll skip this because you all know about it and uh, the land use and land use change sectors in, under which this green belt development also comes in has been made more simplified norms for induction or certification and verification processes. And even small holdings also can join. Why? Because is earlier it was only a contiguous one which will be easy for verification and easy for monitoring and so on. But now we can have them in sporadic patches. But the only thing is that we need to have them in, under one agroecological zone and then you can connect it and so on. In that way, maybe we can uh, access some 15 or 20 industries, green belts and of a particular region, perhaps a, a chamber of a, Telangana industry can take up such project also, can connect up some 50 or 60 or 70 industries green belts together and then make a green belt project. It is possible and then we can. But unfortunately, uh, we do not know what Indian government also would take a stand because now they have taken a stand that they can they cannot be exported or whatsoever it is, these credits and so on. But still, there are different schools advocating for different types of this one. So small land holdings also, like that small green belts also can be connected. And better mechanisms now we have to account for harvest. It's earlier, it was not like that. You cannot harvest from it any way unless it is a disclosed harvest and pre-planned silvicultural system and so on. But now, the final accounting will give you whatever you harvest. Suppose if you are going to have mango and if you want to avail mango fruit productivity, if it, in our plan, if we can have that and we can, or you can have a silvy pastoral system, you can raise fodder and you need not account in this green belt for carbon accounting about this fodder uh, harvesting and so on. Like that, some leverages and some special models have emerged because of which now it has become more ease. That's the reason why earlier this trading system could not take up when in the Kyoto Protocol it was, and now we are under land use sectors, it has be, become more easier and very innovative ways of mechanisms are emerging to make different carbon sequestration products. And 
waiting time for payment returns was also made shorter. In fact, uh, uh, one month or one and a half months back, uh, Rabo Bank of Netherlands uh, have uh, come to India and wanted to have a carbon project in India. And, and we have suggested them to have a, uh, to connect these volunteer carbon credit markets to the voluntary farmers who wanted to join and as some exercises going on on that way and in midst uh, there was a, a small uh, rumor that Indian government has banned export of carbon credits and export of this one so that's where it's lying but still within India we can do this but still what we can think of is we can have a very flexible green belt carbon sequestering models and then the existing green belts, what you have, they do not uh, add anything new to the system because already they are there. But in carbon sequestration and carbon trading systems, if a certification, it should be an additionality additionality to what is existing. So in some uh, areas, we can also think of industries together taking up or connecting this far farmer's model to have green belts outside. And they are not a green belts like a, a permanent green belt like that, so something like that. But for uh, sequestration purposes, we can have such type of uh, sporadic patches in one particular region and then connect to make them. So there are a lot of benefits. If we look at the value of it, in fact, uh, it is a guesstimate. So I call them guesstimate because they are guesses some made because there was no officially reliable or authentic statistics how much area is there with the industries in India and also within that industrial use, how much area is there under the green belts? But what roughly, what we could, uh, uh, some uh, people could uh, make some estimates and so on, a summary of those estimates in, indeed uh, indicate that 0.1 to point. Uh, Two five million hectares will be under green belts in India. Well, if this is true, and with a low sequestration potential of 0.3 million tons to 1.2 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent can be uh, sequestered from these at the moment. But this we can enhance to almost three to four times if proper planning and proper selection of the species and proper selection of uh, the areas and some are adopted. And with the ecological design suitable to the terrain and suitable for the sea sequestration, that we can enhance to four to six times or ideally to 4 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent from that. And in ecological design of green belt sequestration of carbon, remember it's only a co-benefit. And it's an additional benefit to the range of other benefits. It could be pasture or it could be a honey or it could be something, uh, other types of fruits or uh, other things, they can be harvested and so on. And those could provide some livelihood opportunities to some of the people. If it is a, a one lakh to two lakh hectares, I believe it can easily accommodate some 50,000 to 60,000 farm laborers who are landless can be provided some livelihood opportunities in these green belts. Well, in any green belt or in any land use sector, and the assessment of the carbon accounting will be carried out under four different pools. The first pool is about the above ground biomass. In the above ground, what is the amount of biomass that is present? 
and above ground and below ground biomass, but that some biomass is there in the root systems and so on, and that biomass. And in between, we have about a, a litter and so on. And some biomass will be holding in it and litter and dead wood and so on, plus soil. That's the fourth pool. So the total carbon present in all these things you will be accounted for one particular area and how much stock is there this year and how much this stock has changed to the next year or two years after. If it is an increase, we say the carbon is sequestered and if it is a decline, carbon has lost. Uh, so in that way, so the sequestration is the change between two different uh, uh, stocks, uh, not different stock, the same stock, change in the stock between a different time periods. So that you can, can consider at, and it is the annual sequestration. You can come down to the annual sequestration. And we have absolutely very standard scientific methods presented by one of my colleagues at IISC, who is a IPCC member and also on energy professor and H. Ravindranath, who is the authority on this carbon inventories in the land use sectors and energy sector. So uh, we have a one straight uh, method, good methodologies for assessment of these carbons. And the criteria for maximizing the benefits from any of these green belt is selection of the appropriate plantation system and then selection of the suitable species composition and selection of agroecological methods for enhancing the soil organic carbons and also to find out what is uh, how we can arrest leakages and uh, wastages. So, and also a developing simple monitoring system. Now you have every plot, every small plot, whether it is a one hectare or a half hectare, if you give the geo coordinates, they can be easily monitored through different digital mechanisms. That way we have different kinds of species. I think I have picked these five or six species for Telangana state, which can sequester carbon at a very faster rate. And these are the very common species of Deccan platoon. And uh, a developing a sea carbon project, okay, if we can consider the additionality and an ideal project size would be 3000 hectares, but doesn't mind even if it is 2000 hectares. And the land need not be contiguous. It could be in several sporadic patches but of the same agroecological region and all the land need not be under the same ownership. Perhaps you can have a cooperative model or a connected model under one particular agency and a good agency of standing repute can take up the responsibility of connecting all this and the farmers can have their own uh, it could be a bund plantation. Some farmer may say that I, I want uh, the plantations on my bund. Some uh, farmer may say, no, I'll give my whole block. In that way, whatever be that, uh, we can accommodate different types of models under the present uh, carbon sequestration plantations and so on. Well, in Ontario Greenbelt, we have a, a wonderful uh, information published uh, where it has about 7.1 million US dollars uh, annually, and uh, it is 39 uh, US dollars per hectare as co-benefit or as an additional benefit if it is coming. Well, if you look at the damage that causes by the climate change, it could be 43 US dollars per ton of ca additional carbon in the atmosphere. That is also an IPCC figure again. And in that way, considering that damage to this one and the benefits from an ideal uh, 3000 hectares carbon project in the case, well, with good planning around 24,000 tons of 
uh, per annum of C can be sequestered, which is equivalent to nearly 88,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. Or a one hectare plot can yield a carbon revenue of 3,440 if it is a blunt fund plantation to some 27,000 uh, rupees per annum depending upon the plantation type or other uses of the land. And ecosystem services, they are, we cannot monetize them, but still if you monetize, if we attempt to monetize, they can add another 2,000 rupees as, uh, and it provides good habitat, usually is a beneficial fauna, fauna, birds that are good for the agriculture or butterflies or pollinators and bees, such beneficial sun fauna also could come into this. So in this way, well, you have different types of plantation models to conclude. I think it's time that we should, if we want to go towards the low carbon future, green belts are one of the uh, mantras for a countries like India, which is the one of the most uh, sufferers of uh, countries of uh, climate change, where millions of billions of people will get affected and so on. So I think uh, uh, of the, the uh, Telangana Federation of Chamber of uh, Commerce and industry can take up some program of connecting industrial green belts and to make a carbon project. Well, uh, I think, uh, thank you here and I invite uh, any suggestions or any questions or comments to what I have said or you want to add. Any questions, please? <clears throat> yes. I'm just reading this up to that all speakers. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for making a very useful uh, presentation about the green belt and how additional benefits can be, be uh, can be planned. Uh, and also you have printed a very important point for further debate about uh, developing the policy or the detailed protocols for development of green belt, uh, which, uh, and also uh, define the objective of the green belt so that uh, it can be monitored, measured, etc. I think it's one good solution. Probably we would like to plan a further discuss on that topic too. But also you have shown uh, you have shared a very useful information how the green belt, if it is applied in a scientific way and with the eco, eco ecologically uh, background, how it can help uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, addition additional benefits. But also the statistical numbers. Yes, I think uh, it's a good uh, solution that uh, what is the green belt area developed. Uh, how many hectares, etc. Probably one should uh, track the statistics so that it will give a good idea. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, as I suggested, uh, the uh, questions and answers can be taken after the completion of the third speaker. Thank you once again. Now I invite uh, Mr. N. Sai Balaji, a sustainability consultant, for making the presentation on the carbon disclosure project and for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Am I am I audible? Okay. Uh, it's audible. Uh, kindly make a note of it uh, uh, for 20 minutes. I yeah, yeah I'll, I, I do understand the value of time and I'll ensure that my whatever I share today, it's more related to the practical experience and how industries can implement that. I'll ensure that it's within the time. So before I go ahead, I would like to thank the FTCCI team. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this. And like Dr. Kameshwar Rao mentioned that uh, this is one of the first throughout India so far that I have gone into such a session. And uh, I, I believe whatever views I present today, 
uh, would be like considered and taken into respect of the future growth of the sustainability sector and how carbon and climate change can be ma made into an impact. So without wasting any further time, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. Let me know if it's visible. Uh, is it visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, no, it not yes. Yes, sir, is it visible? Okay, okay, great. So, carbon disclosure project, of course, it's, it's kind of a disclosure. It sets up a disclosure criteria for organizations who are planning to say that we are sustainable. Now, in, in the era of, uh, I would say, in the era after the, the post-COVID era, actually companies, organizations are very much aware about what kind of impact does industries make, does companies make on the climate. And the nature of resource depletion, the lack of uh, environmental awareness, and the 1.5 and 2 degree challenges which have to be met as per the Kyoto Protocol, IPCC, and all the ratings, all the requirements, all these guidelines which are framing the complete environmental scenario of the world. Carbon Disclosure Project is, I would recommend, as one of the high-end inputs who are taking the environmental part as a very crucial input. So before I go ahead, I would just like to explain why disclosure is necessary. Like, it's not about company, it's not about the rating system, the guideline, or anything. It is more about why disclosure is necessary. As a, as a consumer throughout my life, so far, uh, without my professional background, as a consumer, in the current era, I am very much aware of, about what impacts my environment. Okay, and if I am very much aware about this kind of impact towards my environment, I would like to go ahead and purchase products which are eco-friendly. Now, even a, uh, even a child who is studying in fourth standard is very much aware about what climate change is. By, if, I, if I just recall the period of 2017 or 2018, no one was thinking that much in the field. Only the high-end or top-end professionals were incorporated and brainstorming towards uh, achieving these targets but now from children to an adult to people who are related to the field of environment to the people who are not climate change is a very serious topic we can see day to day in every scenario we are having in impromptu floods like i live in rajasthan okay i'm born and brought up in tamil nadu but i live in rajasthan and recently we uh, we saw a flood in jodhpur now you see a state which has drought which has very lack of water and there's not enough water for regular irrigation, but can experience flood. So this complete shift of the scenario ranges to what we call as a climate change. And it is real. If you accept it or not, it is real. And climate change is not just impacting the availability of resources. It's going to impact us in terms of our evolution. We are not going to evolve at a better rate. We are going to degrade in terms of evolution due to lack of resources lack of availability of good quality food, lack of proper utilization of energy. And that's what these industries, these companies who are currently, uh, like I would say the environmental conglomerate of the whole world, they are working towards providing a well-processed output so that the environment is least bothered and the impact of climate is reduced. So what is CDP? is just a global environment impact non-profit working organization. So I, I won't go into definition. I won't go into the terms which are written in the presentation. I would just like to explain how I explain these things to a layman. Okay. So CDP is an organization which has given a thought, which has given a thought about these ideas of what can be the impact of these in the industrialization, this urban sprawl, uh, infrastructural developments, lack of education, so all of these into the field of environment, what can be the impact towards the earth in next 50 years or 2030, 2050, 20, uh, 2070, 2080, all these scenarios, CDP is rigorously thinking about this because they want to ensure that people have a guide to follow when it's the right time to meet the climate mitigation goals. So this organization has developed a standard chart for disclosures, okay? Now, as a, as a disclosure entity, me as an organization, what, what it helps to an organization is that it, it would help me let me know that how better I am. So when I was in school, when you all were in school, 
you all had this particular input that you you would get to present it in an examination you would get a report card out of it and from that particular report card you will be able to understand that whether you are passing or failing okay that report card lets us know what's are how good of a quality is our educational background in a similar way cdp kind of provides a disclosure standard under which we all can review where we stand they provide us with a scoring they provide us with a grading and if we are better at a grading that gives us a heads up yeah, that we are doing good and then we can set a target to improve more from the current stage and if we are very poor then that gives us a goal by looking at other companies like other students in our classroom to see how better we can do to reach out to that particular level that's what a disclosure is so it is important to disclose so that you can you can see and benchmark yourself where you stand how much improvement has to be done and what kind of growth potential you can set up for your country okay so how does cdp work it's all about data the only thing the only term that i'm going to talk about majorly today is data everything is data around you the laptop i'm using the cell phones the smartphones that the database on which companies operate the energy bills the water bills the land utilization your financial reports everything is all collected into one medium and then it is read into various aspects now when we read those thing into various aspect that falls under the category of esg that is environmental social and governance cdp majorly focuses on the environmental part so it's kind of the disclosure standard of the whole cdp explains how the environmental part can be broadened what things can be addressed for that particular environmental part and how the goals of those environmental part can help you be number one if you want to stop the climate change so as an investing company if i look at a company if i manufacture steel today i burn a lot of heat i i burn i utilize a lot of coal i utilize a lot of grid electricity now the impact of that particular company manufacturing x tons of steel a day a month or a year if i look at the impact it's going to hinder the resources water energy and all the coals whichever we are using and that is going to impact on climate now if i am a responsible consumer that means if i am a well aware consumer what i am going to do is i'll study about that company and i'll see if the embodied energy of that particular steel is good or not if it's not good i won't go for it and that's why lot many companies these days are targeting uh, design stage net zero which was very well explained by uh, mr praveen that how that can be impacted what is the goal of having a net zero design operation or building operation or a process operation so that the consumers can make an aware choice towards a well defined climate responsive future so investor in companies cdp requests the data of the environmental and information and action so whatever they are doing they collect that data and companies and suppliers they mix up that data with themselves they analyze other companies as well so if i am an industry I, i'll take the data from my suppliers and i'll give uh, i'll take certain inputs from the people from whom i am actually receiving the data so one will be supplier one for me will be the consumer i'll be taking that particular input i'll be calculating my emissions very well explained by uh, mr praveen for scope 1 2 and 3 and those emissions i'll re i'll report to the cdp as per the various reporting standards 14064 is there past 2060 if you are going for uh, carbon neutrality and all these so when i do that at the end of the day the consumers if i disclose these report publicly the consumers living in the market will know how sustainable my product is if it's not sustainable then they would resign from using that and they will switch to a new product i'll give the latest example we are having these cadbury chocolates these days okay uh, i think you all might have at some time in your life have either seen that packet or either you have experienced that chocolate now it has a symbol at the corner of that cadbury which mentions sustainably produced cocoa okay or sustainably ex extracted cocoa you can google that or you can google that as well to understand that that's a informed choice that cadbury has made adding to that previously we all used to get the the silver foiling or the gold foiling on most of the cadbury products but now these days those foilings have been reduced which is reducing the wastage so these are such uh, such sustainable steps that companies are taking which are responsible to make sure that their product is well respected by their consumers 
we have apple the removal of the adapter the removal of the charging brick and the related wire and everything so all these things are adding to such reducing that particular wastage in the market so by the numbers if we talk about why cdp is crucial because if we'll see the score of cdp it ranges top above msci or various rating which we'll see in further slides so there are 680 plus investors which have a, a like asset value of us 100 us dollars of 100 trillion and there are 200 plus supply chain members with over 5.5 trillion us dollars in purchase there are 13000 plus companies who respond through cdp in 2021 so the reason if i disclose myself with respect to cdp then it would be easier for other companies to take that into consideration and see whether my company is eco friendly or not whether my product which i manufacture is going to sustain in a longer run or not because if climate change hits in a couple of years my company will stop for example a steel manufacturer if it's if he still follows uh, these days we are uh, we are talking about making rebars through electric arc furnace but previously we used to use blast furnace so if we do not shift to a technological advancement people will refrain from using that particular steel so they need a steel which is more sustainable more carbon neutral more uh, i would say net zero in terms of manufacturing so that is what an informed choice is. So if any manufacturing unit uses electric arc furnace to produce steels, so I would go ahead and invest in that rather than going for a blast furnace. So this is a, just a basic example how investors are able to choose their scores. Now how CDP eases that? Again, I'll take the school example. So there are three students. One is having 98% as, um, as a score. The other is having 75% and the other is having 57 so there are three different levels if i say that i have or you have two lakh rupees to invest which student will you choose automatically it would be someone who shows a higher score potential it's not about skill set because you cannot measure that but what you can measure you are initially going to invest on that so if someone is having a higher percentage we can say that he deserves to go in a well reputed institute let's invest on him or someone who has a lower percentage, you would say that he is not interested in studying that much, so why to invest on him? So if we are able to make these informed choices by just a mere report card, that's the whole support of CDP disclosure. They are helping us to gain that particular insight on how informed choices easily can be made. It is everywhere. And you have your BW star rated air conditioning systems, right? You know, if it's three star, it's more efficient. But if I talk about COP, that what is the COP of the air conditioner, whether it is 4.6, 4.7, 6.1 or not, you will see, oh, you are not aware of these values. So you won't be making a proper choice. But if I say that a, B, a three star rated refrigerant is more efficient, a four star rated is higher than that, and a five star is extremely higher than that, it would be easier for a layman consumer to choose the right product. And that's what CDP is doing by providing a score to all the investors, to every single layman out there so that they can make in informed choices for stock stock market investment for company shareholding for future investment and goal towards sustainability okay because if there is if we have zero world which is sustainable i won't say that uh, the, any of these industries would not matter if we are not fighting the climate change properly today because they won't sustain for the next 50 years okay so this is how the growth of cdp disclosure had been uh, has been over the years in 2003, it was very less, but now in 2021, you can see it has taken a drastic, drastic turn. And best part is everyone is aware. I look, I go on to LinkedIn, I look onto profiles. Every second person is a professional from the sustainability field. Everyone wants to talk about ESG. Everyone actually wants to provide an input on carbon. But the issue is that this knowledge is not widespread throughout our India right now. So although companies of US, UK, the European origins are able to make the informed choices, but we are yet not able to make them because our industry is lacking the inputs very open. So I think in coming times, that's going to be the real growth for the professionals also who are working in the field and for companies also who are looking to manufacture more sustainable products. So how credible is CDP? Out of all these rating systems, I don't know how many of you are aware about these, but these are rating systems which help uh, idealize the investment background for any particular company. So if any particular 
organization has a score if they are enlisted with cdp and they have a good score they are considered as one among the top okay the cdp falls among the top 5 for rating systems and believe me guys this is going to be the upcoming future it would be easier for you to choose a stock and invest in a layman term i'm explaining this because now you have to see the company portfolio how much investment is there and everything but now if i need to make an informed choice i'll go to the esg report i'll check the cdp score if it's better i'll go ahead and invest in it without thinking for a long term return so sorry, that's how mr balaji sorry for interrupting yeah. yes sir yeah, just it's a final stage that's all that sure 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 that's it for helping you oh, yeah sure thank you thank you so much so that's the value of uh, credible uh, credibility of cdp so all these organization cater to cdp data they rate all these uh, organizations which are out there industries uh, commercial units companies and all and they rate them so that it's easier for us or the other companies to make informed choices now the tcfd the goals with the tcfd so the tcfd goes for the task force for climate related financial disclosure so basically if we are looking for a proper investment what should be the range of that investment what should be the governance input on that how the strategies can be maintained so that the investment remains profitable for the longer term and tcfd is i think it would be the next step which should, which as part of bsrs would be uh, sorry bisr would be followed in india uh, in the coming time and it will be linked with the tcfd completely because india is one of the uh, like fastest growing economies throughout the world these days so what things can be done cdp only focuses on your climate input with respect to companies who are making an environmental impact so you need to provide inputs of ghg emissions target risk management for water security like let's say it's coca cola so how much water they are using due to that if there is any kind of drought or water scarcity in the regions where they are working what are the risk associated with that if you are a chemical based company you manufacture chemicals and if you are looking forward to release those chemicals in the open sea then the impact on water quality is hampered and all these things are to be publicly disclosed then we have forest so if i want to set up a factory i'll have to clear a debris land if it's a if it's a i would say if it's a barren land it's okay but if it's a green land then i need to report that in towards my work because that's a bad thing that i'm doing and that's what cdp takes into consideration while they put us go towards it now why disclose to cdp it gives you a recognition like i said you prepare yourself for exam you you get good marks in it and then if you are one of the top rankers you will get a recognition throughout the school and that's the that's the job that the cdp is conducting it gives you a ranking it it gives that ranking gives you a value at global level and it's easier for banks for financial institutions i would say for informed investors for informed consumers like us to make the right and valuable choices it's simple do you take the climate change related governance and you uh, you manage the climate change and use risk and opportunities of your work you report the ghg emissions you uh, you figure out the energy matrix and then you ask the value chain to engage with your particular work so this is the complete idea of a cdp disclosure all these are catered together so i would say it's one of those ratings which only focuses on the impact of your organization towards sustainability so the global trend is all these investor look at the disclosure outputs and then it helps you in increasing or decreasing the stakeholder confidence it um, it basically helps you in defining the investor regimes where one wants to invest or not and it's very good for startups okay so if you are a startup into a manufacturing field into a reporting field or into a sustainability field you need to see that if your product is directly hampered or not and third so far because they we don't need a separate policy regulation for environmental uh, environmental reporting and checkup so that's why uh, cdp is going to be one of the best in the coming time so indian disclosure highlights we have total uh are reported a total of 32 lakh crore risk on the climate change 1.2 billion tons of co2 emissions are reported and 5% of electricity is sourced from renewable sources so all of these companies who have reported to cdp in 2021 all of these meet with these particular parameters 
in the coming time. So more reporting, more we will be able to highlight. The more data we have, the more better we can make our country as part of our goals. This is just a quick risk heat map for various different sectors. You can see in the graph below that from low intensity of climate risk to a high intensity of climate risk, if we compare these particular uh, these particular risk map to all the various companies we have, apparel, biotech, pharma, cement, and all, you can see the two crucial risk elements are for apparel, where is, wherein we are talking about technology, and for hospitality, where is, uh, wherein we are talking about acute physical. So acute physical is more about the climatic impact uh, due to floods, due to earthquakes, due to any kind of uh, natural calamity. So yes, hospitality industry is a lot hampered by that because if any of such calamities happen, a big disruption comes into that uh, industry. Similarly, if we look at the technology part, if apparel industry is not going to upgrade their technology to a more sustainable version, they are going to be hampered with respect to climate risk. So all the various sectors, if you will see, they are very much highlighted and you can see which sectors are inducing these particular risks. So if we say, if you talk about acute physical, if it's um, like the time of horizon is medium term, that is it can take over from three to five years or uh, three to seven years, the impact would be very high because it's causing the climate change. It is because of climate change. A quick example, if I'll give, would be of an agricultural field where if we are planning to grow crops, but due to lack of water, due to lack of resources, if, if we are not able to grow a particular crop, it's going to hinder the food cycle. So the production and food units will be less. We have to import a lot of grains from out other countries as well. And that's going to inflate a lot of the market. So acute physical are going to range into high losses in coming time. So let's see the emerging regulation. They have a high magnitude of impact. The legal authorities will have a high magnitude of impact. The reputation would be high. So an uh, organization which is openly reporting themselves and which are taking extensive measures towards disclosing to climate-related uh, climate reports, their reputation will be always considered high. And although it might be staying for short term, but it will always be a high. Technology, of course, if we improve a technology, there is, uh, there is more, more chance of accepting that as part of its magnitude in change with respect to climate impact. So the physical risk, regulatory risk, reputational and market risk, and technological risk, when all are taken into consideration and mitigated, these risks are, are transferred. If they are not mitigated, they are transferred to increased operational and maintenance costs, increased compliance and administration. Everything will be increasing. So it's basically the poorer you are in terms of operation and the less environmentally aware you are, the more inputs, the more financial considerations, the more cost uh, impact uh, would be done at your particular business end. So when we look to a transition plan, the, when we report into CDP, we are e it's easy for us to disclose and access the capital to see the number of assets, the capital expenditure are easily measured, direct and indirect emissions and costs are totally taken into consideration. We can see the liabilities that we have at our particular end and the revenues. So when all of these are taken into consideration, these this is a forward-looking plan of CDP. They will include all these as well in coming time. And then I believe they the CDP would be among the, one of the top tier ESG inputs as well. So this is the opportunities for Indian companies. And I think this would be the most important slide throughout the complete presentation that we have 31 identified risks, 65 risks identified on products and service, 21 risks identified for resilience, 56 identified risks for energy sources and 64 for resource efficiency. So they have a big market out there and we can encourage development of such companies and sharing additional opportunities to have a growth in these particular perspectives. So, the benefits of reporting are very simple. Like I said, investors take over communication. It's easier, okay? And the reputation is higher. It helps you benchmark, compare uh, two companies, Google and Apple. If we compare them, it would be easier for you to do that. Manage risk and uncover opportunities, of course. Then boost your competitive advantage. If you are better, if you're better at reporting, the market will respecting you a lot. And then, get ahead with the regulation. So you will be always complying with the regulation. You won't have any challenges uh, meeting out the local requirements.
benefits of CDP disclosure. Again, if we see that 70% of responding companies say improves their uh, reputation and nearly half say reporting CDP helps their organization to be more competitive. So competition is the edge. You won't know any company which is starting from uh, a seed and would become a conglomerate or a unicorn. You would never know that when that time comes in the current 2021 era. And the last is that uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. And I think this is, uh, the, uh, this is uh, the statement which was just mentioned by the team of FTCCI as well. You need to measure and that's what is going to impact the complete capital investment in the coming time. So disclosures are the key uh, to the more you report, the more better investment you will get, the more easier will be for you to fight out the current demand and meet out the market requirements. So just a general what the various standards of disclosure mean. There is another one which is F, F stands for if nothing is disclosed. But the first is D, that is, if you think that let us disclose about my organization, you are not talking about a, a meeting a goal or anything, but you are just openly disclosing. The next is awareness, that if you are capable to disclose, you need to be aware about the issues and the climate risks that are out there towards your company. Then management, that you set up a target, you achieve that particular target, and the leadership is you you go beyond that target. Like if you're planning to achieve a reduction of 5% every year, you skip that, your leadership takes a decision of going into SBTI, TCFD, and they uh, they make a more ambitious target. They, they do extreme high efforts to achieve and increase that scoring. So that's what the CDP scoring criteria sets off. And if you do not disclose, it is just a F grading. So everything is publicly available on CDP net. And that's the best part about a nonprofit organization that you can easily access them on the CDP website. So you can check that out. And if you still have any queries, you can reach out to the FTCCI team. That's it from my end, guys. This is Sai Balaji. I really appreciate you being a patient listener. And thanks to the whole team for taking this whole presentation into consideration. And I'm open to questions. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sai Balaji, for making a very uh, brief presentation on the CDP. Um, especially the importance of the CDP, how it is gaining. And when somebody, some organization take the CDP as an core in, in its real interest, what is the business opportunities? Uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing your thoughts on the CDP. But, but before I go for the Q&A session, I would like to personally thank all the three speakers. I know each subject is itself is a one-day program. That's a very tough, tough I think a very tough job to the speakers. Uh, actually, our intention is to start this. Probably based on this uh, today's presentation, probably for each topic uh, we may run a separate program to support the industry. And I look forward to all the speakers' cooperation in this regard. Uh, there are a few questions from the uh, from, from the participants. I'm happy to say that uh, 50 people logged in and 47 people that, uh, are, are in this for this round of session. I'm really thankful. So, uh, well, the first question to Mr. Praveen, uh, how does bank sees climate solution startups? Do they approve financial capital to these climate uh, startups even with this? How credible do you think the carbon offsets or when reforestation is considered as an option? Mr. Praveen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, uh, banks consider uh, financing to the climate startups as well. We have seen uh, recently the banks have been uh, funding well the electric vehicles and battery manufacturing technology, which is still considered a uh, new technology. There is a risk involved. Even if we take the earliest days of solar where the capex of solar was more than uh, four times the present cost, still some of the earliest projects were funded by Indian banks and going beyond the funding. And there are many options available like many corporates have made available the startup fund or through CSR they 
keep some some amount separate for the technology uh, assistance etc and regarding the reforestation i think uh, uh, commissioner rao sir will be better uh, able to explain better but uh, on the live answer i have uh, typed that even the triple c recognizes reforestation as one of the credible met methods of emission reduction and there are methodologies available uh, and this is the nature based solution available for the emission reduction hence some investors consider this as better in terms of or comparatively uh, to the industrial emission reductions thank you thank you so now the one proceed to dr commissioner rao whether miyawaki forest will provide a quick uh, descent and the carbon six and biodiversity contribution in urban areas in the backdrop of limited available space sorry uh, uh, the question is not clear to me i think your mic is far from you uh, whether miyawaki forest will okay, use okay. Uh, uh, will give a quick uh, solution as a carbon six and biodiversity contributors in urban areas in the backdrop of limited available spaces yeah miyawaki plantations are um, in the recent times they are picking up very fast and something like that but uh, like our green uh, green revolution program all these fast growing and fast yielding and all these things we do not know what the long term impacts on the land and land fertility and soil and so on so miyawaki plantations at the moment as per their record as concerned they harvest more carbon sequest more carbon more biomass and so on <clears throat> but we do not know what they uh, consequences of on long term basis uh, as ecologists i can say they are adverse to the soil and ecosystem on long run why because is in miyawaki maybe we are getting high productivity biomass but the plants will be under very suffocating state they will be under high competition for light resources water soil space and so on but as they don't have any option that they would be growing in such a way but uh ecologically plants will not be happy in such plantations that's my personal opinion <laughs> because of it is like accommodating some 10 people in one small room and ask them to live together maybe 10 people are living but what's the standard of living <laughs> that's it. so in that way miyawaki i don't suggest uh, as a good my fair model because like green revolution also it has time we should have stopped with some 20 years or 30 years back the green revolution uh, tools but we have continued even continuing till today the impact on land and all these things are now uh, they are under very adverse so is the case with the miyawaki plantation also thank you sir i think uh, i one group takeaway is any thing what we plan is periodically we need to uh, assess the benefits uh, merits and demerits and we should have a strategy uh, if necessary uh, some changes thank you very much sir. yes yes uh, before i go to the next section i would like to have small announcement uh, my friend anita has posted about the feedback link uh, this probably all the participants can share their feedback so very simple it doesn't take more than one minute Okay, now I uh, want to say to uh, Mr. Sai Balaji, uh, as a chemical industry in India, what commitments can we give for CDP with respect to those or objects of climate change? Uh, what is the store impact if not fulfill the targets within the uh, within the timelines notified, uh, not reported? Yeah. Okay. So uh, first, I'll go with what how whenever we talk about disclosing towards CDP. how we define a base year okay so base year there is no foundation for cdp disclosure to define a base year it is up to you what you decide as is fit for your organization for some it can be 2018 for some it can be 2019 for a new facts facility it can be 2021 as well now if i say how do i decide about a base year 
the thing is very simple i first monitor my continuous practice of operation like how uh, if my facility is fully fledged at a maximum production capacity in terms of industry or in terms of a, i if i'd say if if it's a commercial facility so if they are running at a maximum potential capacity then i will take that year as my base year i need to be always improving from the maximum emission that i can do and set a target to do the least with respect to that and that's what an efficient base year is designed and it can be anything for anyone else now the second question is what if the second question that is what if i fail to disclose properly towards my setup target in cdp right so correct me if i missed out that if i if i fail to disclose the uh, no. target or my reporting right no the question is actually i have reported in last year said let me say 10% something like that Uh, mm-hmm. Since I could not accomplish the ten percent goal, the self goal, how it will reflect on the CDP score? Okay, so it is is it it is just going to be on the basis of a percentile. So if last year you achieved a A rating for that particular uh, entity for which you set up a target of ten percent, for last year you achieved A rating for that. Now this year, if you are if you are not even meeting that score, so your percentile will be reflected based on your past performance. it will not be compared on throughout the global level it will be only compared to your previous performance and that's how it's you are going to be rated so it does not mean that from a you will directly shift to d b or c no it's not going to be that your score will be reduced with respect to your current performance that's it on that particular parameter and i think the third is what amendments uh, if a, if a chemical chemical industry needs to fight climate change what mitigation strategies can they adopt right yeah. yeah so for a chemical industry first how i define this how many resources are they are going to have so let's say if it's a chlor alkali in- industry okay so if it's a chlor alkali industry so simple is the water utilization would be very crucial so whatever parameters you are looking into the environment you need to first see that your water stewardship is reduced in terms of your your maintenance your management of water resources should be higher so you should not release your waste outside the plant for that you should plan a zld which is zero liquid discharge design zero liquid discharge are very much in demand these days where all the facility required water is generated on site via rain water harvesting or on site waste water treatment plants it is reused on site and then it is no not sent out to a sewage it is being evaporated into the environment from the site only so you your entering capacity of water onto the project site would be zero and your water exiting the project site would be zero as well and that is zero liquid discharge now to do that you utilize all the water your excess water which which is like part of a sewage you use a steel plate which is heated at i think 100 degrees celsius or more than that and then water is sprinkled over it through shower heads and that water when it comes in contact with that heating plate it gets evaporated into the environment and that's how you uh, it is just a mere example of defining a zero liquid discharge design and that's how it is done for industries it is a current demand in clothing industries as well because again a lot amount of water is being used there Yeah, thank you very much for all the speakers uh, trying to clarify the questions and uh, also the participants if they can be touch with us with any additional uh, questions or that we will try to uh, reach the experts and try to get it back and uh, because of the shortage of the time i would like to of course we have not received any further questions uh, thank you very much again once again for all the speakers now i request uh, uh, sri suresh kumar ji our vice our vice president to say what a thanks good afternoon it is my privilege to propose a hearty vote of thanks on the successful conclusion of the webinar on climate change and mitigation planning by industry on behalf of all and on behalf of the federation sincere thanks to dr kameshwar uh, rao kodam raju former professor of environmental sciences andhra pradesh Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam. Mr. Parvin Jadhav, Head Environmental and Social Risk, RBL Bank Limited. Mr. N. Sai Balaji, Sustainability Consultant, Green 
building consulting and engineering yes sir the deliberation have imparted more knowledge on ghg qualification yes. and reporting green green belt and carbon sequestration i also thank the members of environment committee and inform audience for their active participation i also thank our partner gd metla affiliate treatment limited for supporting this event thank you all thank you uh, thank you sir before i close i request all the participants <coughs> to spend uh, one or two minutes and uh, respond with the feedback it will really help us thank, thank, you. thank you so much sir thank you Thank you, sir. Thank you. And also special thanks to Anshita for supporting this event. Thank you, Mr. Parsan, who really supports. <laughs> thank you, Anshita. I request all the participants. Uh, with the first speakers, I will be in touch with you. Uh, we want uh, the continuity of this uh, association for the benefit of the industry. Thank you very, very much once again, sir. Commissioner, special thanks to you. I know that you are. Uh, uh, traveling in, uh, in one of the forest area for the last few days. I think you it's my pleasure, out. sir. It's my pleasure to associate with you all, and it's a great uh, initiative. I, I I think, and it it should go a long way. I think I think your state should be a model for other states also. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. I agree with uh, sir. I completely agree. Thank you, Sai Balaji. I think uh, we are really connected for the first time. Uh, thanks to Praveen for uh, giving this contact. Thank you. See you also. Always you respond to me.